And we have a very, very special guest here. And it's my pleasure to announce him. A man who shouldn't need an introduction, who was not, maybe not solely responsible for house music, but certainly put deepness into it and teach the machines some soul. Mr. Larry Hurt. So, Larry, you, you told me last night while you were recording a great radio show for us here that um, your time as a child and a, as a teenager was very important for you in terms of music. And mm -hmm. yeah, how, how did you come well, to music? Well, those were just the formative years for me where um, just the way I kind of um, started to appreciate music and um, started to, oh, well, the way I approach music when I um, do my original music was all formed during these years of maybe from about 1968 to 1978. So it covers a, a lot of styles of music also. Yeah. And you were listening to radio a lot back then, right? Yeah, that's pretty much all you really had, you know, back in those days and um, even like during the 60s, I don't think FM radio had really blossomed at that time. So it was kind of AM radio uh, singles, your two, three minute singles. And, but the, the good thing about it was it was a, a wide range of styles. So I can see where kind of in doing some research as far as looking back to be able to say something, I did notice, you know, this crazy, you know, spectrum of things that I was hearing all the time. So it was not one kind of music that caught no, your it was, attention? Uh, like blues, rock, jazz, soul, gospel, I think, were the, uh, the essential ones. And I think um, reggae started to come into the picture during my teen years. And when I started, you know, got to the point where I started seeking out music, you know, that I kind of related to that maybe wasn't on the radio. And you also brought the first record you ever yeah, bought with you. Uh, yeah, saved my lunch money. And, yeah, because we have a custom to go into this record store with my mother and father and see them buy records. You know how kids tend to be. You want to do what you see your parents do. So I saved my lunch money and asked my mother when we're going to the record store so I can buy a record too. You know. And this is the record that I bought right here. It's the, actually the, uh, the main. And were Sly and the Family Stone um, role models for you in terms of songwriting or? Well, I was too young to have uh, role models other than my parents at this time because I was maybe about nine or 10 years old. But I did take notice of the music to the point where, you know, I made a mental note and wanted to, you know, get this 45, you know. And of course, since I have 145, you take great pride in that. You just play it over and over and over. And that's what I did, how kids do. And when did you start to learn an instrument or? Um, that would be a lot of years later. Um, I was kind of the late bloomer out of the, the siblings in my family. I have four brothers. And all four of them were playing guitars and things like that when they were like 10 or 11 years old. So our parents always cultivated, you know, having um, some level of um, uh, culture injected into our upbringing. So we had a piano in the house, and they would always buy us the toy versions of different instruments, of bongos, guitars, drums, things like that. And my brother started to really get more into it um, before I did. It was, I was about 17 years old when I decided to or was motivated to pursue learning the drums. Yeah. And did your parents play instruments too? Or? Yeah, they both played piano. They had uh, piano lessons in their upbringing. Yeah. And they both sang. Yeah, yeah. And why drums? Pardon? Why drums? It was, I just thought it was cool. I mean, I, was, um, I took guitar as my instrument in school. We had to take an instrument. Well, we had to take two. We had to take um, a flute or a recorder and then a second instrument. 
and I chose guitar for that because I figured if my brothers were doing it, I could do it too. And I, that's what I did for my grade. But in the process of that going on, I was kind of exposed to people playing other instruments and kind of started to pay attention to the drummer's role in the, uh, in the rhythm section and felt like that would be a good place for me. And you started playing in bands back then already? Yeah, or? I started right away. Because actually, um, there's, um, I met a guy in the neighborhood uh, by the name of Kevin Lacey, and he said he was putting a band together. And I told him, uh, he, told, he said he was looking for a drummer. And I said, oh, I play drums. And I hadn't started playing drums yet. You know, I was kind of just thinking about it. So I had that. I had to escalate the process of getting some drums and hide out from this guy until I kind of learned how to do something. But I, I found out that I had a, a natural aptitude for doing it. And, and as things turned out, I didn't end up in the band with this guy, but I ended up in a band with some older guys who were playing like uh, R&B covers and things like that. And how long did you play with them? Um, I can't really remember, because pretty much all the things I did on drums uh, spanned about a seven-year period with me on jam bands, R&B cover bands, um, art rock bands, reggae, and, uh, uh, contemporary jazz kind of setups. Yeah. And you, you mentioned 1977 as the year you picked yeah, up Yeah, that's drums. when I started. See, so like that period between 77 and 84, where I kind of come stumble into the whole um, blossoming kind of house music scene or movement or whatever you want to call it. Because 1977 was, to my knowledge, also the year Robert Williams opened the warehouse and brought Frankie Knuckles oh, that to, was the year? Okay. to Chicago. Yeah, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't realize that. And were you aware of that whole No, I club? wasn't, because I was so involved in the live music scene. So the clubs I was familiar with were more the live music venues. Um, so I was kind of a late bloomer with regards to club music also, because I was just doing something totally different at that time. And when did you get on the club circuit then? Well, 84, when I uh, kind of got to the point in the bands that I was dealing with where they weren't really receptive to my creative ideas, me being the drummer. I don't think it was really all that customary for the drummer to have creative ideas. They just play the beat. So I left the last band that I was in and bought myself a synthesizer and a drum machine to keep the time so I could kind of experiment with the sounds I'd been hearing the keyboard players kind of use in the, the bands that I had been in. And I found it intriguing, you know, because it's new technology, these ARP synthesizers, Moog, Oberheims, all those things. I just was really drawn to it. And do you remember the first synthesizer and the first drum machine? I bought a Roland TR-707 for the drum machine. The keyboard was a, what, Roland Jupiter 6. Do you, do you still have them? <laughs> no, no, I don't have it. Uh, I, I think I was condemned, because after a certain amount of time of gathering, buying instruments as I was able to, I found myself with a whole lot of equipment kind of crowding myself out of my place. So I was trying to condense down. And I sold it to someone. <laughs> Yes. And um, you, you knew about the club scene back then as you bought your drum machine and your synthesizer? Or? Not really. I was, um, like I said, I was on the, the live um, club uh, side of things. And uh, one, of, one of the guys on the block, uh, I let him hear the, the, the stuff I was kind of playing around with. And he, he said that it sounded like the music they played at the warehouse. And once he, I got that piece of information, then I had to start doing some research and find out, okay, what is this warehouse place? Maybe it can be uh, somewhere where I can kind of maybe be able to test out what I'm doing, see if it relates to anything that's going on, see if anybody likes it. And you, you paid the warehouse then a visit? Or Pardon? You paid the warehouse then a visit to... No, actually, I, th I would end up being a little late for the warehouse. And even though I, when I did find out where it was located, it turns out there was like a few blocks from where I worked. But I think they were in, it was a transition time for them where um, Frankie Knuckles was, was it, wait, the warehouse was Frankie Knuckles, yeah. yeah. 
he was, they were transitioning to the next place that Frankie Knuckles played at, which was called um, the Power Plant. So that's where I kind of come into full exposure, if you would say, to kind of the, the club setting, the dance club setting. And what was the first song you showed to a friend of yours who said it sounds like it was Warehouse? A Mystery of Love, the original version of that. You have that with you, right? We can uh, have a listen. Yeah, I do. Um, because we might as well uh, talk while I try to find it. <laughs> this this was also the first record you released then, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, it should be also on here. Right? It, that would it wouldn't be that version. Oh. That's the third version. <laughs> So, so how many versions are there of Mr. There was an original version that what I, what my personal prototype that I had done that, uh, that I had a copy of. I made three acetates. I kept a copy. I gave one to Frankie Knuckles and I gave the other one to Ron Hardy. And since then, they've, I've heard that they've exchanged hands a whole lot of times. I think one of the acetates was in Larry LeVan's possession when he died. And from that point, I don't know where it went to. But uh, you can ask me something else while I try to track um, down this. Ron, you mentioned yeah, Ron. we got digital music uh, meltdown here. So much <laughs> stuff. Yeah. You mentioned Ron Hardy. He, he was probably the other most influential DJ Chicago had back then, right? He was playing at the music box. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you went, you went to the music box then? Uh, or? Yeah, yeah, I went to it. Um, I think I, my personal preference, you know, my personality kind of being more laid back person ended up being Frankie Knuckles, me being kind of a serious natured person and things like that. I wanted kind of, uh, I was more comfortable in what felt like a more serious environment where Ron Hardy was kind of like real upbeat, real kind of wild for me, but I, I, I went to it. And then I went to lots of events that Ron Hardy played and um, actually heard him play in, you know, in different styles that I had never heard before, so I was surprised to find out more about his, his uh, level of ability. Yeah. So, so what were the main differences between Frankie Knuckles as a DJ and Ron Hardy? Um, well, I couldn't tell you in any technical terms, but it just felt like um, Ron Hardy was more kind of aiming for the uh, a younger, more energetic crowd and Frankie Knuckles is kind of doing more the, the next age bracket up, I think, you know, who you know, don't want to get out there and hurt their knees when they're dancing on the dance floor, but do want to get out and socialize and hear good music. So one being the house punk and the other the soul gentleman or something like that? Kind of something like that, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm still trying to track this out, song down while we're talking though. You can, and you yeah, what were, the what were the reactions to uh, Mystery of Love then? Oh, the re reactions were great. It was uh, actually so great, it was to the point that uh, Ron Hardy claimed that he made the song, <laughs> and Frankie Knuckles claimed that he made the song. <laughs> and I kind of show up on the scene and kind of foil everything for both of them when people, people that uh, knew me said this is the guy who made the Mystery of Love uh, track and you know, so that kinda, kinda put a little tension in the relationship between myself and Frankie and Ron Hardy. Not, not from my perspective, but I, I think they kinda maybe always felt like I would harbor some resentment for that, but it, to me it was more of a compliment. I mean, who would claim something that they feel is crap? Yeah. You know, so it, it, it uh, confirmed for me that it was actually something, I was onto something, and people could relate to. So was this all, always a big thing in Chicago, that uh, uh, Well, even the scene, the scene we're talking about, it's not like a massive scene. We're not talking about a half million people. You know, we're talking about like maybe a few thousand kids, maybe, you know. So which, healthy enough to survive, but not like, it's not like the following that say like, uh, 50 Cent has, or you know, Guns and Roses and things like that, but enough to kind of, you know, kind of survive. But competition was fierce nonetheless? Yeah, because of course, um, there are uh, all of the local DJs, so even if you're dealing with like a, a, a thousand 
people who may regularly go out and party that may be divided between seven or eight DJs who are doing different little events and um, residencies around the city. So that, that number is kind of reduced as far as, you know, a certain amount of going to Frankie Knuckles, a certain amount of go to Ron Hardy, a certain amount of going to Wayne Williams and Andre Hatchett and some of those other guys, you know, who were around at the time, but just less known. And this also manifested in the two main labels back at the time in Chicago, Trax Records on the one hand and DJ International on the other. I'm not sure I understand where you're coming from. With the, the competition that. thing, you know. Oh, yeah, well, there's always competition in business. I mean, if two people, is, uh, if I'm selling uh, shirts and you're selling shirts, we're automatically in a competition. So, yeah, that's just a natural part of it. But actually, the, the funny thing about DJ International and Trax is they started off as a partnership. And they, uh, they couldn't keep from betraying each other. And that's why it turned into two labels. You know, the things that all the stories that we've heard over the years about, you know, the craftiness and some of the um, business tactics of those guys, they started off doing those things to each other. And that is what kind of separated them into two labels. Because actually, Rocky Jones, who ran tra uh, DJ International, he was doing a label. And uh, Larry Sherman had the pressing plant, so he was doing the pressing for him. And Larry Sherman would bootleg Rocky's records before they even got on the street and undercut them. <laughs> and so that's how it turned into two labels. You know? So the warning signs were there you know, right from the beginning. But you know, we didn't know the inner workings of what was going on until years later. So, um, yeah, you, you didn't really get all the royalties you should have, right, from... No, not me. Uh, the first, like, the, the things I did on tracks in DJ International, no, we got good amounts from him. It's uh, a far cry from what uh, uh, producers and artists can look forward to receiving right now. Because we I get, definitely got, you know, numerous tens of thousands of dollars from Larry Sherman for one song. But you know, these days you're lucky if you get a hundred dollars as an advance for a release. So, I mean, we didn't, you know, come out of it in in the poorhouse, no. So, so all those stories about the shady business tactics of Larry Sherman are the stories are true. They can be blown out of proportion because it's not like even like right now. I still, you know, have the advantage of where I'm still doing releases and DJ International is not. And I'm still doing releases and who cares about what Trax is doing in 2005? You know, every, their whole legacy is like 1986, 1987, and that's what they have to survive on because nobody would trust them with any real good music. They'll give them their throwaway material just to kind of do something with the label just for the sake of doing it. But you put Mystery of Love originally out on your own label, right? Yeah, that came out on Alleviate. That was Alleviate's first release, yeah. And then you licensed it to uh, DJ International? No, I didn't. I, I re-recorded it. It ended up being a totally different version because uh, what I, the thing I did, it was done at home, you know, on, uh, I don't know if it was a reel-to-reel -reel or a cassette or something like that, but it's something very low budget, very, uh, nuts and bolts kind of a thing. And so I don't, don't think the recording quality was up to what they were trying to release. So we d went into a studio and did another rendition of it. And this, and the third time I included Robert on it doing the spoken part at the beginning and the singing at the end. So maybe we should have a listen to the other version then. <laughs> yeah, if you because I totally forgot about the uh, <laughs> <laughs> If you can't find. Yeah, it's just so hard to find everything in here. It's so much music. Uh, what song am I looking for? Mystery of Love. I just don't know if it's going to be the right version, though. the initial version. It'll be one of them. Every version is fine. But the one, to, uh, that first one is just special for me. Just, it, it just holds the essence of you know, what I was doing, what just naturally flowed out of me. The next ones ended up being more rehearsed. So I don't really feel the same intensity in those versions, but yeah. that's uh, showbiz, I guess. Thank you.
And uh, when did this version of this timeless piece this of house music? This one came out in uh, 1986. Yeah, that was the DJ International release. And, and, yeah. and this was the version that also uh, came to the most prominence, right? Yeah, because I'm uh, DJ International, the, the thing that I kind of rationalized out for myself was, you know, I, you know, me doing Alleviated, I was just basically had records in the trunk of my car and I could take them to the, the rec local record stores that I knew, but I couldn't, I didn't have a plan as far as getting them outside of the boundaries of Chicago. So that's what I said when um, Robert Owens and Harry Dennis were actually the ones who, you know, knew something about DJ International and tracks and, you know, took me to meetings uh, with those guys. And I felt like, you know, at least they can get it outside of the boundaries of the city. I just didn't really, you know, I didn't really think that far ahead, you know, just me coming from being a drummer to being thrust to, into the position of a label CEO. It just wasn't really what I was expecting. It's just what happened at the time, you know, so I didn't have any plan. And, and so that's where DJ International and uh, Tracks did help me out, despite all of the horror stories. You know, I did get something out of it that I wanted. You, you just mentioned Robert Owens and Harry Dennis. Mm -hmm. How did you get in touch with those guys? Um, actually, the same guy in my neighborhood who uh, told, uh, told me about the warehouse actually introduced me to a, a DJ named Tony Harris who lived around the corner from where my mother lived. So I went and um, uh, met him and uh, kind of was talking with him and, and was asking about some of the uh, parties going on around town that were playing like, the, uh, well, at that time, or disco music. Um, it was kind of at the end of uh, the disco era. And I started to go to some events and just do my, my research and find out what was going on. Because prior to that, all I was really familiar with was like, the biggest hits like the Bee Gees and Donna Summer and uh, that kind of thing, a Chic, those kind of groups. And uh, the clubs, of course, were taking it uh, a lot of steps further, maybe not, not even just one. So I had to go out and see what was going on. I ended up meeting Robert Owens um, at one of the parties that I went to. Um, uh, Tony Harris introduced me to him, and he, we started talking. He was telling me about um, him being a vocalist and things like that. And we just exchanged information and just kind of coordinated getting together. And when we did that, on that first day, we recorded our prototype to a path. Because I think he, had, he was kind of in a similar situation as myself, where he was, um, his create, creative ideas were being stifled because he had a lot of people who were telling him that he couldn't sing, he would never amount to anything and things like that. And, and like I said, for me being the drummer in the band and the other uh, musicians not being receptive to the ideas, we just had all of these bottled up ideas. So it was a, a perfect coming together, you know, of uh, like-minded individuals. And that's why it just took off so quick. We just, I had uh, tons of ideas and he had tons of ideas and we put our ideas together. And you, you formed Fingers Inc. then, right? The we, I modified the, the whole, the name thing is another tricky issue because um, it started off as Loose Fingers. My little brothers made up this whole Loose Fingers thing. It just kind of uh, goes back to my tendency to uh, grab an instrument and start faking like I knew how to play it or get on the piano and fake like I'm playing something. So I'd always just move my fingers fast. And they started you know, saying this Loose Fingers thing and then when I put a record out, that's what I ended up using for the artist name because I didn't know what the response was going to be to this stuff. It's off the wall. It's, uh, I don't know anything about the music business other than, you know, I hear records and I buy them. That's pretty much the extent of, you know, what I knew. So I, that's why I use that name as like a safety net if it turns out to be a total embarrassment. You know, I can actually hide and say, oh, I don't know who that Loose Fingers is, you know. And then it was modified to Mr. Fingers, you know, within, well, one release, really. And then modified to Fingers, Inc. when, you know, I teamed up with Robert. Were you all also a DJ back then already, or? No, I was, uh, you know, like I say, I'm kind of new to the whole, um, culture, I think, and um, 
I started to pay more attention, you know, even though, because we had, you know, disco music and early electronic music that was already on the radio. And, um, but it just made, made me focus a little bit more on and intentionally pay attention. And um, what was the question? <laughs> If you were a DJ back then. No, I wasn't a DJ. No, um, the, the mixes, I think, was the thing that um, got me curious about how, how that worked, the principles behind blending the two records together. You know, me being a drummer, I played in um, bands with two drummers. So I was like, OK, it's got to be just like that. So I think I can do it if I can get, get my hands on some turntables, get all the tools I need. And it turned out that that was true. Once I got my hands on them and I could figure it out, and I just kind of started doing it from that point for, for my own fun. You know, I was in my um, research, of course, I was starting to buy 12 inch records, you know, stuff I was hearing in the mixes. I would record the mix and get my Walkman and go down to the record store and ask the guys, what's this and what's this and what's this and buy things. And I would come home and do my experimentation to see, can I do what Farley Jack Master Funk does and all these guys on the radio. So that's where that started. Farley, Checkmaster Funk, and the radio. This was WBMX, yeah. BMX, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the importance of radio in Chicago back then. Well, ra radio is just as important then as it is now. If you want people to hear what you're doing, they have to have a forum you know, where they have access to it. And um, I think the timing was played a, a key key role in the um, willingness to kind of put on music that was a little outside of the, the norm or the acceptable standard at the time because FM was kind of kind of a new and uh, so they would typically play like whole album sides on FM radio because you got stereo now as opposed to AM and you know, you play a whole rock album, a whole jazz album, things like that. They play that whole 16 minute version of Donna Summer and things like that. So it was more kind of the audio files kind of place to hear music. And, and they were competing against AM, which was the standard at the time. And people were just so accustomed to their transistor radio that just had AM on it, didn't have a FM. So they had, you know, liberty to take all kinds of chances back then. And they were the ones that kind of, in response to some of the college stations around Chicago who had these mix shows on with guys, you know, who were not known but doing the same things as uh, Farley and Frankie Knuckles and Hot Mix Five guys. And they had the things that they were doing on the college stations. And all of the stations started to notice on certain days and at certain times all of their audience would disappear and they would go to these college stations. And so FM radio was the one who decided, okay, well, we need to get us, get some guys to do this on our stations, which was, you know, brave at the time. And that's where the whole Hot Mix 5 concept originated. Hot Mix 5 were Ralphie Rosario, Farley Checkmaster Funk, and who else? Mickey Oliver, Scott Smoking Seals. Is that, that's four? Yeah. I, I'm Can't remember not remembering. And it's probably easy, but I'm just not remembering who the fifth person is right now. And those were mixed shows, right? With yeah. nothing else but what was being called uh, house music already in well, Chicago. It wasn't being called house music. That didn't start till later, To the media got a hold of it. And it has to have some identifying title. When they get it, we were just listening to these cool records, you know. They were from all around the world. We hadn't dubbed it anything at the time. It was just that show where they play all these records and you tape it and you run to the record store the next day and find the things you want to get. Do you have something with you that is some sort of classic WBMX disco song or whatever? Classic WBMX, well, wow. So those three tracks are pretty much some sort of essence of what was going on in Chicago back uh -huh. then. Having yeah, it's uh, incomplete, because like I said, a lot of stuff, I, a lot of things that were coming out of like Belgium, Spain, Holland, Germany, were actually the, uh, the predecessors of 
what the things that started to happen in Chicago and Detroit. And uh, of course, New York always had its own kind of thing going on because of the amount of distance, us being in the Midwest and them on the East Coast. So they had their own kind of approach. So we, we just listened to Chip E, time to check, right? Yeah. The other one was Savage um, Process. Yeah. Savage begin, Progress, yeah. Uh, Hearts Begin to Beat, and the last one was One Way Music, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Italo, disco, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, and this was much more important for Chicago than it was for, for instance, New York. And do you know why? I don't know. Well, like? that's what we were hearing. It's not like we were the ones, you know, telling the radio what to play. That's what was being uh, placed before us. So, uh, yeah, that was someone else's decision. The people, who, uh, program directors at the stations in, in our region. So maybe in Detroit, they were, the, the program directors, you know, just had different ideas. Uh, I'm just asking because some of these Italo tracks have uh, pretty strange lyrics, right, to uh, English ears because they, uh, the lyrics uh, don't always make sense, right? Some of is those that, records. Is that a question? Yeah, that's a question. Why, why it was like that? Oh, I don't know. Was, that would be a question for the artist to answer. <laughs> I, I couldn't no, be, why, why people responded to that kind of stuff. It was the, the, the music, the, the rhythmic stuff that was going on, and the, the melodies and things like that, you know, because we just respond on a, a, a primal level, you know, as a, just like when I was a little kid, I mean, it's not like I knew anything about chords and scales and progressions and things like that. All I knew was, you know, I like it or I don't. So this same thing applies to the masses a whole lot. They don't have any musical knowledge, but they know what they like when they hear it. And that's what that was the case with these records we were hearing. And, um, and in um, respect to your, respect to your own career, what went on? after Mystery of Love and after you? Well, you it was being pretty um, uh, quick progress because um, by the time Mystery of Love was on the street, Robert and, Robert and I had worked up tons and tons of other things and were trying to figure out, you know, ways of getting some of those things out on the street so that uh, hence comes the, some of the, the alter ego names that, you know, I was starting to use to get different projects out on the street. Like the, Gherkin Jerks and the It and House Factors and all these different names I started making up at the time, which is inspired by uh, George Clinton, because I saw him doing that, you know, so it's like that could work. Yeah. So that's the explanation for all the, the different monikers you yeah. used? Yeah, mm -hmm. George yeah, Clinton. It's nothing complicated or a deep philosophical thing. It's just a, a way, avenue of getting more things out, because I did have a whole lot of um, uh, material. And during the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, you also got a major record deal, right, with MCA, I um, I think yeah. probably in, um, like around 88, which was pretty quick once again, you know, because from the scene kind of really taking off and blossoming in Chicago in 86. And of course, uh, New York is a hop, skip, and a jump away in Miami. So those were the three spots where it was really starting to take off. Of course, uh, labels start to notice when, like for myself, I have a, a Mystery Love is on the chart right next to What Have You Done For Me Lately. And A&M notices, you know, what is this song? I'm sure they took a great offense to it because there's a, a, a much larger investment involved, you know, in getting these uh, big name artists on these charts. And next thing you know, these guys making, you know, songs in their basements and they're on the charts right alongside them. So some uh, dates started to come in and I think actually the first artist to get signed was a diva which, uh, out of New York. I think Blaze was pretty quick right near the, the beginnings of that. And uh, Jovan, even though an album didn't come out, he got signed by Warner Brothers. And it kind of went in, in, in little increments like that, whereas I think the next one ended up being like Tin City with Atlantic. And then, of course, I had, I was always kind of this misunderstood character, like, well, people were like, Do, can we even approach this guy? Because it's like he doesn't, we didn't never, you never see him. He doesn't really talk a whole lot to people. He just kind of more observes everything that's going on. 
So I had some people kind of standoffish about me, even though Sony Music was interested and they were calling around saying, what's this guy like? Is, you know, he's like one of these fanatical artist people where, you know, he won't do what we need him to do because of this whole artistic thing. And Capitol and uh, Warner Brothers. And of course, each one of them had a, a different concept about the changes they were already going to start to make. Because uh, Warner Brothers was going to replace Ron Wilson with Arnold Jarvis, which would have been would have been cool, but you know I wasn't I was I didn't feel all that comfortable with them coming in and changing a person that I picked to be in the project that I kind of originated. So I didn't really like that a whole lot. So it took a minute for somebody to come around who kind of understood what I wanted to do, and I also wanted to you know continue doing the label thing that I had started doing a few years earlier. And so MCA was the one that said, uh, we'll do a label deal in addition to the artist deal. And I already had the uh, introduction album was already recorded. So it was just a matter of just getting, you know, the master mixes to them and them getting it out. And do you have an example with you of, the, of one of the songs of introduction? introduction. Because it, it was a step further for you, right, than the yeah, stuff you did? Yeah, this would be maybe about eight, six, eight. This would be maybe about five years into kind of developing um, my composition skills and production skills. I think something's on here. But, uh, no. Not um. So this song was completely done by you, right? In terms of lyrics, yeah, it was actually a mile, milestone for me. Where I, the first song that I <laughs> sang the lead vocals to, but actually, interesting story behind it because um, uh, David Hollister was uh, the one who was uh, planned to sing the song, and he didn't show up at the studio that day, and so I just ended up kind of laying down a, a, a rough vocal track so I could remember kind of the basic melody that I had thought of for the lyrics. And pretty much everybody who was present at the studio that day, day was saying that they, they liked you know, what I had done with it and thought I should probably keep it that way. And I, to, uh, to my uh, good fortunes, I took their advice. And, you know, and we actually did, we actually released this as a single even before the MCA deal, because this was done, this dated back to like 1989 when I did this one, which was a couple years before I did the um, MCA uh, deal. And it actually started a bidding war because this one ended up on the chart right next to Ben Around the World and I, 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 and stuff like that. So all these labels were wondering, once again, here are these guys, you know, these basement guys coming, getting right on the chart next to our big artists that we put a, a million dollars behind. So it, companies started coming with uh, bids at that point. You know. And uh, what were your final experiences with dealing with the major label? I didn't like it because they still, you kind of turn into an employee when you're a signed artist to a label as opposed to this uh, capacity that I had gotten used to, you know, even though I stumbled into it. I had gotten accustomed to the idea of, you know, having control over when releases come out, what releases come out, what they sound like, and I didn't have anybody telling me, well, well, do this or do that or make it sound like Teddy Roddy or make it sound like this or something like that. You know? So I, I enjoyed having that freedom, and I started to see myself losing that with the major labels. So, so you would always suggest to a young kid uh, when getting into music and releasing, releasing music to start his own label? And I mean, if you, have, if you have the means to do that, if you have money to invest in manufacturing your 12 inches or CDs or whatever it, uh, medium you choose to put out, if you can do that, it's, it's a great learning experience as far as the inner workings of selling selling recorded music and 
But if you want to just go right straight to like the M and M thing or Destiny's Child thing, I guess you do have to deal with the majors because you uh, will need their influence as far as radio and television and things like that. So I enjoy the freedom as opposed to the large financial gain personally. Um, speaking of Eminem, um, what most people probably don't know is that you also have done a few hip hop beats in your life. Yeah, right? I've done a lot. I've, I actually um, I'm had so many close calls with people where uh, they were thinking about, you know, connecting with me to do something, but for some reason, I've all this cloud has always hung over me that where people think I'm inaccessible. And so they say, oh, we want to work with this guy, but we don't know. Can't, who knows how to get in touch with him? He's so mysterious, you know. And actually, Common Sense was one of those guys, you know. Um, Crucial Conflict, you know, some of those early tongue twister, some of those guys. And, and some of the people that were kind of doing support work for them were students of mine, where I would always take a couple of people under my wing and, you know, kind of um, teach them a little bit about a different production styles and you know just to and it would help me at the same time while, while I'm they're asking me questions then I have a reason to learn it so I can give them an answer so it was kind of a, a two-way thing where I, I learned something and I share something and some of them you know have you know worked with some of some of the artists out of Chicago yeah. mm -hmm. and common sense is known as mm -hmm. common today right Common Sense, you mentioned him. He's known yeah. as Common yeah. today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you've brought some of those hip hop beats with you, right? Yeah, I got a few here. You know, <laughs> just they're, they're old, but you know, maybe this is maybe about 10 years back now that I really took some time and did my experimenting around with. Uh, I guess that one been kind of more like a premiere kind of. So it's so hard in this hip hop business. <laughs> and is this one of the reasons why this stuff never saw the light of day? It, it's, it was all unreleased, right? Uh, yeah, it's unreleased. Yeah. Um, well, kind of, I was just doing a, really a demo for these guys, you know, because they were trying to pursue their thing. You know, Chicago had its kind of blossoming, well it had a hip hop scene, but it's just kind of, just really not visible like LA or New York and that kind of thing. So there are people there, you know, of course they're inspired by the things they're hearing people do in other parts of the country, but just really like, like the guy said in the label, no Russells, no, no Puff Daddies and stuff like that in Chicago, so they were pretty much on their own, you know. And a lot of people, you know, didn't didn't uh, end up achieving much of anything. And I have to get back to the 80s in Chicago once again, um, because what is your take on the term house music? Um, there are so many different stories about this. What is this. my take on it? Yeah, how did it really came up? I don't really have a take. <laughs> I, I know what it is, you know, for what it is. It's just a term that, you know, is kind of coined to kind of encapsulate this thing that we're talking about, you know, so just like uh, we uh, refer to tomatoes and lettuce as vegetables, we kind of kind of put titles on things to help people get a handle, you know, on what it is that we're kind of discussing. Yeah. And it came from the warehouse, then, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so that whole warehouse, that house part of it was kind of adapted you know, for the, the name of the style. And um, if we're talking about terms, uh, who is Jack and what is he all about? I don't know who Jack is. <laughs> <laughs> Jack is a fictional character that some guy made up. You know, I don't yeah. know who he is. But you don't know how this came up, this whole Jack No, somebody box. just, that kind of goes back to some of the Hot Mix 5 things on the radio where, um, in addition to you know beat mixing records, they would some, sometimes play acapellas and things on top of records. And you know, okay, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Maya Angelou, and Angela Davis were popular ones for DJs to play. And this 
particular guy, I forget his name, Chuck Roberts, I think, just made up this speech that was kind of very reminiscent of a, um, a cinnamon thing, I think. Uh, something that was on Jive Records. I can't really recall the title off the top of my head. And that was his little speech that became legendary, but there's no real person, Jack, to and, my knowledge. No. <laughs> and someone took the speech, right, and put it on a track of yours? Yeah, they put it on top of Can You Feel It? And, yeah. uh, and among others, but that was the one that ended up kind of coming out in various bootlegs and things like that. Yes. Do you remember the day you produced Can You Feel It? I just remember that it was in the winter, and I, at that time I was living in this um, apartment that had these really big windows, kind of a loft place, and I had kind of like a view of downtown Chicago, and it was snowing. And all my friends that were over that night, all of them, all of they, they all remember that visual of the snow falling and this music playing. And, and actually, a friend of mine actually gave the uh, the song its title because I couldn't think of what to call it. That actually happened a whole lot where I asked friends to name the song for me. Yeah. So sometime in the winter of uh, 85. Yeah. Make, makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, and this song also characterizes maybe the summer of love on a little island called England in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. and. Did you experience that too? Because you, I think you toured Europe with Fingers Inc. back then, right? Yeah, but I don't know if we were kind of getting around to some of the um, kind of, uh, all of the parties that were going on. And uh, of course, us just coming over for a couple of weeks, we wouldn't be able to experience what they're experiencing year round. You know? So I can't say that I fully experienced it. But you, but you played at places like, uh, the Hacienda in yeah. Manchester, uh, right? And Hippodrome and the Fridge and some of those old clubs that I don't, I don't know if they're still around now. But, yeah. And how did you feel about that coming from Chicago, flying over to Europe and seeing all those kids totally losing it to your music? Uh, well, of course, it's very encouraging to see that happening. Uh, but everything was happening so fast because, um, you know, between me kind of getting my handle on operating a label and acting in that capacity and composing and producing stuff and kind of helping Robert out to, with uh, live shows and things like that. There were just so many things going on that you didn't really have time to sit back and you know just think about everything. We were so busy doing things that there was no time to think until after you were finished doing all the things that, that were going on. So. I didn't really have any conscious thoughts other than, you know, it being cool to me and um, uh, just getting a glimpse into what uh, guys like the Jackson Five have experienced and things like that. That was very cool, but for me, it wasn't really what my goal was as an individual. I think Robert was more the person who was interested in being out front, and me, I'm kind of, of a support person, like a characteristic of my decision to play drums in the band, where I am an integral part, but I'm in the background. I, I wasn't really uh, all that interested in being in the front. But it was a cool experience to go and kind of set the tone for all of the people who started to travel internationally after that, because we were kind of um, England's first encounter with neighborhoods. Because prior to us coming, the people, the caliber of artists that had been over there was like Curtis Mayfield, The Temptations, Earth, Wind and Fire, you know, these big artists. So they had a certain amount of apprehension and I had people downright scared of me because the movies like um, uh, Menace to Society and Boys in the Hood and all this stuff was out there giving them an impression of what especially black youths were like in America. So we had a lot of people, you know, they were very standoffish. Standoffish. I got called ragamuffin 
a whole lot, and I had to find out what that meant. You know, it's like troublemaker. <laughs> but you're not really a menace to society. No, no, I'm cool. I'm a peaceful person. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Uh, the baseline from Can You Feel It, what, what scent did you use and what, what preset, what's that the secret was, uh, to that fat, fat sound? The Roland Juno 2, I think. Yeah, Juno 2, old. Um, it wasn't even a MIDI keyboard. Yeah. It was just kind of old school synthesizer. You had to play it? Yeah, I played it by hand. Yeah. Uh, respect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Did you know back then that you created a timeless cla uh, classic piece oh, no, of dance there's no music? Way, there's no way to know up front if you're doing something. You're just, uh, you just really aim to do something that people like. And you know, when you get something that kind of has a, a longevity to it, you know, that's great. You know, but you can't really plan that up front or everybody's <laughs> record would be a timeless classic if you could just orchestrate that yourself. It's something that uh, the people listening to it decide. I couldn't decide it. Yeah. So how is your approach to songwriting then? Free flow, very organic. I don't really go in, in the studio trying to do anything in particular. I go in there and say, I'm going to do something. And if it works out, cool. If it doesn't, cool too. I'll just try again tomorrow. Because that's what I pretty much do when I'm, you know, you know, at home, I'm in the studio every day of the week, so I have plenty of opportunities to kind of sit there and come up with an idea. So you, you relocated during the mid-90s, right? Mm -hmm. Or during the end of the 90s from Chicago to Memphis right. and Tennessee. So what were your reasons for that, leaving one of the centers? I just needed to get centers? away. I needed a, a different backdrop. I was you know, once again, my, my personality type comes into play where me being kind of a low-key, laid-back person, and now I'm kind of thrust into this stuff that's kind of, to me, feels like it's spinning out of control because, first of all, it wasn't planned, but even though it's, it, it's happening, I'm trying to keep pace with it and keep my sanity at the same time, and I felt myself losing it. I can definitely uh, understand, you know, Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and these people who like, you know, they, they cure it with drugs. I just, I had to do something before I self-destructed. I had to get away and get somewhere peaceful where I could think and take stock of what was going on and my own personal goals. And um, you're pretty much busy to this day, right? With making and releasing releasing music because yeah. i remember during the mid 90s or so there were all these stories circulating around you that mr fingers has stopped making music and <laughs> doesn't want to be related <laughs> to music anymore <laughs> well that's just another one of those inc instances of the media taking a statement and you know overblowing it you know it's like a pe person who works as a teacher or a garbage man or a doctor, they take a break. They take what's called a vacation. And that's what I was trying to do. I guess my mistake was mentioning it at all. That probably would have solved everything, but that's what it is just a classic of, example of my um, reason, one of the reasons why I tend to be standoffish when it comes to media, because they never convey what you were actually conveying. If I go to a family get together and an uncle of me asks, what I'm doing, what I'm playing, or what I'm making, it's hard to tell. It's hard to call it house music or disco, electro. It's, it's hard to give a name, because it's like, I don't know, actually. It's just dance m music for my part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what would you, would you have said, like, in 1984, when the house music was not really born as house music? Mm -hmm. What did you say, um, I'm making I would just say I, I made some music. <laughs> I made my own little music track here. But, and, but the thing that kind of allows the person who's listening to have their freedom is to just let them hear it and let them decide what it is you know, for their own practical uses. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was it dance music 
from the beginning or yeah it was dance music yeah. that, that's the purpose of the whole the simplistic four on the floor drum beat that's the the easiest universal one for the people can understand you know it's very uh, elementary and anybody can get it and get on the beat and dance yeah. mm -hmm. uh, another question in the back here yeah. um uh, the simple use in your hip hop productions is pretty obvious. Um, the, the what? The sample use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the use of samples. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the our green drum break, for instance. Um, do you use any samples in your house productions too? Uh, not typically. It will be more things that um, say, like if I have a chorus or something that I need repeated, but I don't really feel up to singing it. You know. The, the numerous different times I'll sample stuff like that and place it where it needs to be in the track. But as far as um, sampling other people's tracks and things like that, I, I'm not really into that. I think it's kind of, I think it's disrespectful. Personally, you know, kind of no, with my ex, um, kind of background going into playing music and trying to attain a certain level of proficiency on an instrument, you know what people go through who, you know, learn an instrument, uh, like uh, you can understand you know, Chick Corea, how much time he had to put in, and Stanley Clark, and uh, these, uh, Al Demiola, these great, you know, legendary people. And I don't feel comfortable doing that. So I, and I take a great deal of pride knowing that, you know, I created something from nothing, which is what uh, the definition of creating is. Yeah. And you can be creative with samples, but creating is taking something and taking nothing and making something. Thank you. Okay. Still trying to find this song. Let's see. James. Hello. Hi, Larry. Um, sorry, just over here. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you, because when I hear your songs, one thing that always gets me about them is they're just so warm and emotive, you know, like the strings are very emotive. Maybe they sound kind of like a, an old soul record somehow, but it's all, it's all electronic, you know? And I just wondered if, I know it's pretty hard sometimes to explain how you did that, and maybe, I don't even know if you know how you did that, yeah. but if there's any way you can just impart on us some of the, so, some of how you got that richness. Yeah, into. I don't really can't say that I have a, a a technical way that I approach it, but I do. I do kind of I find a sound that's kind of near what I want, what I'm thinking in my head or picturing in my head, and I actually alter the sound. So a lot of the sounds you hear in records I do, they're not the factory sounds that come out out of these units. I, I they've been modified to kind of really fit into the architecture of what I'm trying to do, where I start with one. Actually, the, the, the sounds kind of direct me as far as, you know, what's going to happen. And, and then I just modify them to really uh, um, fit better, you know, in my humble opinion, you know, into what I'm doing. I mean, it's just because I, I guess it's just, I'm trying to imagine how, how you would start writing something like, you know, I mean, I yeah, just, I, I just, uh, I can't imagine how you sit and actually write those songs. Do you well, see I what can, I mean? I can tell you that my, my friends, I, I'm the butt of a lot of jokes among the people who know me because they know the way I work and there's no structure to it. And uh, like even some of the guys that we were kind of upstairs doing some sessions yesterday, they may have got a glimpse into like, it doesn't seem like this guy does anything intentionally. He just gets on the equipment and just start doing something. And that's exactly what I do. So do you, do you kind of switch off the thinking a bit and just go? Yeah. Yeah, I, I hate to have to think too much because then it turns into work. And I want the music to be a pleasurable experience. And I think even on a primal level, that's conveyed two people, you know, we have a, a component of our being called, you know, uh, intuition. And I think people pick up on the, the tension or, you know, that kind of thing in music. And it can either attract or repel you. 
And when you were writing those those songs as well, I mean, would would it be something that you'd have all the equipment set up, okay? Um, would you kind of have to have the the whole song done in one take, kind of thing, dropped off onto a perfect mix the first time, or or were you able to multi-track and go back and correct mistakes? Well, at the beginning, it was uh, pretty. This is pre before DATs and all those other new uh, digital um, mediums. So I was doing things on uh, cassette tapes and reel-to-reels, and there wasn't much room for doing any overdubs. So you play, I would maybe do one part on the reel and get captured the bass line and the basic chords. Like for a song like Can You Feel It, I captured the, uh, the drum pattern that I programmed and the um, bass line and the chords, and then some of the other stuff that's on top, I kind of dubbed to a cassette, which was the only other thing I had as far as recording, and put the other little lines on the top. And that cassette was the master recording of that song. <laughs> so, so Can You Feel It is just two, is two tracks in a way. Yeah, and, just and bring, down, uh, bring Down the Walls is actually like a one take thing, and Never No More Lonely, some of those things, because me and Robert just get together and just kind of just have fun with music. and. And every once in a while, we would just capture something where we just press the record button and something good came, came out, like Bring Down the Walls, and we had captured it. And we didn't even attempt to go in and refine it or anything like that. And it's like, no, this is the track. And was that kind of, was it a kind of, you know, the first cut is the deepest mentality then, a bit like reggae, you know? It was kind of like you were in the studio, you jammed it out, and then... Yeah. You tried to leave it. Yeah, it's like the, the James Brown way of doing things. They just jam, go in the studio and, and jam. And what we end up hearing is like a edited down portion of those jam sessions. And we were kind of doing that same thing because very, very little structure as far as approach. And I guess kind of like one last one from me. But um, how do you feel when you hear tracks that kind of rip off Can You Feel It or some of the other really big classics? in a very blatant way. Well, it's hard to be impressed because it, it, uh, I'm more impressed when I hear somebody's original material and it gives me a connection with them. A lot of times, even um, if you have a song that's sampled, I have a tendency to where my attention will focus on that original artist. And then I don't really have a connection with the new person. All I'm, you know, I'm into the Marvin Gaye sample or whoever it may be. So it has a tendency to work in reverse for me. Thanks. You're welcome. Speaking of Robert Owens, are you still in touch with him and making yeah. music with him, or? We haven't been able to do any music. Because, uh, my living in Memphis and him living in London is kind of uh, makes, makes that. that uh, Pretty big challenge, yeah, but I talk to him all the time. Talked to him a couple of weeks ago in China. Because we, we stay in touch. I mean, we have a lot of songs that we control jointly, so we do a lot of business together and have to stay, have to stay in communication to make sure everything's done to each individual satisfaction. You know? And it would be really nice to hear the song you did with him on the same day as Bring Down the Walls, oh, if you... Yeah, it was, uh, if, I if you can dig a, it up. If I had a better system, as far as finding these things, it wouldn't uh, take us so long here. Let's see. Um, OK, there it is. When will this come out then? When will it come out? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know because this is like, like I said, we did this on the same day as Bring Down the Walls, which is like in 1986, and where we just kind of fooling around, ad living, and just recording the session. Um, so I, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't even guess. We're trying. We're trying our best, but you know, and, and uh, since I fund the label out of my own pocket, and I'm not uh, Bill Gates. Uh, 
Oprah Winfrey or somebody like that, there's limitations to what I'm able to do and I have to pace myself where I don't bankrupt myself, where I have the, the whole thing has to end. So, so hopefully I'll try, but I can't tell you when. Fingers crossed. Um, so it's not easy to run your own label these days oh, and no, make no, a living out easy. of it? Pardon? And make a living out of it? It's not easy, but it can be done. I mean, as I'm living proof of, and a whole lot of people who run those small labels, it's just how you approach things, how, how realistic you are about how much you can invest in, you know, um, in making some, a product that people will be able to comprehend and receive and want to buy. You just have to be for real with yourself. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Mm -hmm. No? Then I would like to thank Larry Hurd very much. <laughs>